France so far this February, but that is set to change by Thursday. This cold front will start to introduce more cloud and outbreaks of rain. Not for long, however, as high pressure builds, so the end of the month could be very quiet indeed. But let's concentrate on that cloud. Nothing particularly significant, but showery outbreaks of rain moving through Germany, France and also in across the Pyrenees. Colder air tucking in behind as well. But Eastern Europe still under an influence of high pressure at the moment. We will start to see those showers drifting their way steadily eastwards. Fair amount of cloud across parts of Croatia and into Italy. There's that frontal system producing that snow across the higher ground of uh, Spain, but also that showery rain into France, stretching up into Germany and some snow to come into Poland as well. So as we move through Friday, these weather fronts are all drifting their way steadily southeast. There'll be some showers to come across the Balkans potentially, but it's a largely quiet story generally through the eastern Mediterranean, but noticeably cooler as that frontal system is driving in a northerly airflow. So this is the story then in London and in Paris. The rain doesn't last long, but it will be cool with single figures expected as we go into next week. A few scattered showers for Berlin, plenty of showers for split Croatia though. Take care. What makes us who we are? if not the way we experience the world. Because while first class is something you can buy, world class is everything we do. Welcome to world class. Welcome to Singapore Airlines. The world is full of opportunities. New leaders, new decisions. An idea can change the world. Sometimes even create new ones. Fulfillment is different for everybody. And together, we can make the most of it. How we invest today is how we live tomorrow. Istanbul. But this has to be the strangest of all. Music is such an important tool in our lives, not just to bring pleasure, but also to heal and to bring hope. We are just in a period now that African brands are just owning that, owning what we have and projecting it in however they see fit. I just love this place because this is somewhere where memory itself is set in stone. This festival is all about light over darkness, the triumph of good over evil. And that idol over there, Kali, stands as a symbol of hope and power to everyone in the community. Inspiring arts and culture on BBC World News. BBC World News, the biggest African and international news stories. Focus on Africa. Hello and welcome to Focus on Africa. I am Peter Okwache, live in the Nigerian capital, Abuja, where the country is gearing up for polls this weekend. And as campaigning reaches its final stages, we examine the role that religion plays in how people cast their ballots. And from state assembly seats to governor roles to the presidency itself, why are there so few women running for office in this election? And I'm Lucrecia Burak in London, also in the programme today. At least four people are killed after Cyclone Freddy makes landfall on Madagascar's east coast. The storm is now headed to Mozambique. 
Joint naval exercises involving South Africa, Chinese and Russian forces continue in the Indian Ocean, much to the anger of the West. Thanks for joining us here on BBC World News Focus on Africa. It's just about 60 hours to go before Nigerians head to the polls to vote in a new president. Now, elections in this country are often marred by violence um, between supporters of one party and the other. And we've seen the same thing here this year. As a matter of fact, some candidates have been unable to campaign in some parts of the country where they are deemed unwelcome. But today, uh, President Mohamedou Buhari watched as the 18 candidates vying to take over his seat signed a peace accord promising Nigerians not only free and fair elections, but elections devoid of any violence. Uh, this signing ceremony was also witnessed by members of the diplomatic corps, former presidents both of Nigeria and other African countries, as well as the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission. But first, one of the most sought after uh, votes in Nigerian elections is the religious vote. Nigeria is almost evenly divided between Christians and Muslims. And a lot of the times they cast their votes on these religious lines. And politicians have for years now taken advantage of these voters. My colleague Jean Otalo has been looking at the situation in Asaba in Delta State in southwest Nigeria. If you don't have your permanent voters now, I'll ask you to stand outside this has been the weekly opening for this church and many others across the country over the past few weeks. Religious leaders encouraging their congregation to vote and reminding people of its importance. This church has even created a dramatization about voting. I am so so fed up. I am tired of this nature. You are tired. Want to vote for a better leader? Have you gotten your PBC? It is my PBC. Pastor Marvelous preaches to around 500 people each week. In this city alone, there are over 300 churches. With similar numbers of churches across the country, that's a lot of potential voters. The problem we have in the Christian dog now, they don't want to vote. So we are trying to encourage them. Without us, nobody will be there. Without our votes, because our votes are very powerful. Very, very powerful. These worshippers come here every week and sadly their prayers haven't changed in years. I'm a mother of four. In, a, in this coming election, I want the president that will come to give the children constant education and security where the children will go to school and not be afraid of being kidnapped. From the next government, I would like them to support and empower the widows as a lot of them has little kids to take care and um, they need money to take care of themselves too and something to do to keep them going. In this way, scarcely. Let them bring the press to the normal price so that people, even the less privileged, or the others can be able to buy the fair. That is what I'm asking. As he's coming, let he do what is right so that people will not be dying of hunger. If you go to hospital now, you see many people lying down there, no money to, to buy, buy their drugs, nothing. So people are dying. There are hundreds of ethnic groups and tribes, and these divisions sometimes lead to conflict and violence. Consequently, there are regular calls for religion to be relegated to the back seat. But for many, this is still the deciding factor. The chief imam here is very clear about his message to his congregation. Whenever you elect somebody that is Muslim as a leader, 
you can get many things from them. You can leave your complaint to them, what you need, what uh, uh, they can do for you as a help to your community, to your religion. And then when we are preaching, he know what you are preaching about. So by that, there's a more opportunity for us to elect somebody that is Muslim. So tell me, what do you want from your incoming president? I want the um, currency of Nigeria to be strengthened against the dollar. And then I want the worker salaries to be increased because uh, a civil servant can barely afford to feed his or her family three square meals per day. The education sector needs to be improved, really needs to be worked on the infrastructure, the quality of teachers, and the stops, you know, the strike, they, we don't want any more strike. I want the government to empower people. When the people are being empowered, it tends to like, like um, reduce the crime rate on, um, in Nigeria. In southern Nigeria, yeah, that's, uh, the security situation, I say it's still better than in the northern Nigeria. Yeah, we can come to mosque and pray, uh, you know, with our uh, minds, uh, we'll be settled, we'll be very free, but some of our brothers in the north can't even go to the mosques. Either they've been attacked by bandits or Boko Haram, and all. some of them, uh, they, they, even in their farms, when the farmers used to pay ransom to bandits and all, so I think the coming president should you know, work on the security. Regardless of religion, their prayers have the same theme, a better future for all Nigerians. Gina Otalo, BBC News, Asaba, Nigeria. Well, another demographic whose vote is sought after by politicians here in Nigeria is that of the women folk. Women make up about 49% of the population. But when it comes to elected positions, they only take up about 7% of the total elective positions in the country. And this year, analysts fear that number is going to go down even further. My colleague and our BBC Women's Affairs editor, uh, Azizat Oluwole, has been checking out the numbers. Nigerians are heading to the polls to elect a new president, parliament and state representatives. But only about 10% of the candidates are women. In Nigeria, few women participate in politics. The opportunities available to women in the political space uh, not as many. You, you hardly would, if you look at the hierarchy of the political parties, you'll find very few women. Economic inequality, gender-based violence and other discriminatory practices are some of the challenges Nigerian women face. Politician Natasha Akbuti thinks there are several other factors limiting the number of Nigerian women in politics. Most people will say women don't support women. Well, that's true. To an extent, you get to see that there's a larger trust between the male folks than the women folks. But we can improve on that. Another is um, the fear of rejection. Nigeria has one of the lowest rates of female participation in politics in Africa. Female politicians managed to gain only 62 of around 1,000 seats that were available in the previous election. On February 25th and March 11th, Nigerians will come out to vote for their next president, national lawmakers and state representatives. Nigerian women are not well represented. Although women make up 49% of the country's population, only a few of them are standing for office. But UN Women believes their number can increase in the future. You have to learn politics, you have to study it, you have to understand. It's a science, it's an art that you have to really, really understand for you. So we are working in terms of uh, developing resource centers for women in politics in Nigeria. A bill that would create new positions specifically for women in parliament was rejected by lawmakers last year. But a federal court approved 35% of public seats for women. No decision has been made yet. Uh, we might not, you know, be able to ascertain the extent to which government is committed to some of these things because um, this issue has been on over a long period of time. The only female presidential candidate, Chichi Ojay, feels a wider cultural issue is at play. 
our traditional culture believes that a woman should be under a man and that a woman's voice must not be higher than a man. So me being a female, the only female in the race among my peers, um, society would probably think that I'm a rebel, um, I'm, I'm going against the norm. For young female candidates that are new in politics, like Rukayat Shitu, they are determined to find their place. There is this lot of talks from people, negative talks from people that a woman is meant to be somewhere not in the open space. We have, we, it is normal for people to say all sorts of things, but it is your right to always manage them by dusting it away from you. With few women in senior political positions, activists are concerned that issues relating to women will not be adequately addressed. Azizat Olalua. BBC News, Lagos. Azizat Olaolua reporting there. Now, just away from those elections and a quick update on another story that we've been following here in Nigeria. The country's Supreme Court has adjourned for a second time its ruling on the central bank's decision to redesign old notes, uh, re to, to withdraw old Naira notes and replace them with new redesigned ones. The further postponement means that with many businesses no longer accepting old notes, the shortage of cash will continue. And we did see some protests in several states in the country earlier this week. Now, let's return to the elections now and talk to my guest. She's Faith Dafe Joseph, one of the top uh, broadcast journalists here in Nigeria. Thanks a lot for talking to us, Faith. Let's return to this peace deal that was signed today ahead of Saturday's polls. You've seen them signed before. Have you got faith in them? No, I don't have faith in them. And this is because there's no consequence or punitive action attached to it. It relies on the moral compass of politicians. And we have seen that fail time and time again. There is no consequence for action. There's no way to trace back who committed what crime to any politician. So at the end of the day, it's just window dressing. They come on, they sign it, business goes on as usual. I mean, even during the signing today, the chairman of the committee, who was a former Nigerian um, head of state, he also admitted that even though this was signed four years ago, we st still saw violence across the country on polling day. Exactly. And this is the reason why INEC has been pushing for an electoral offenses commission, saying that it is even overburdened in how to prosecute any of these electoral violence cases. And because you cannot really hold people responsible, because INEC feels overburdened, and for some reason, people don't get punished, there is no point signing a peace deal that people will just sign and go back home and forget they even signed it. Okay, I mean, let's talk about something else. I know you're very big on social issues. I mean, and those stark uh, figures that we just heard now, 49 of this country made up of women, but only 7% of, uh, only, women only make up, take up 7% of elective offices in this country. Why is the number so low? I honestly don't know what to tell you with that because I have tried to talk to women who are running or who have tried to run and the problems that they have are problems that have been recurring and you even said numbers, like you said, numbers are dropping. Sometimes they talk about the funding for women, the support that women are supposed to get. Just last year there was supposed to be an affirmative action signed to give 35% of women a chance to run. That bill was defeated at the National Assembly. It didn't go through. So at the end of the day, it feels that until that is done, we might not get a lot of women participate in an election in Nigeria, especially considering the fact that they make up, like you said, 49%, we make up 49% of the population. But unfortunately, but, we're but not where a, the decisions are made. That's a huge number. Why aren't women then rallying themselves and saying, listen, we've got these numbers, we've got to use these numbers? Is it I mean, in, we saw it in, in America a few years ago when women, some women didn't believe that a woman should be president. Is that the case? It is really hard to convince women that women can be presidents or governors because we live in a largely patriarchal society and it would take a while for that to change. There is some groundwork being done, but it is taking a little longer time, which was why a lot of people clamored for the 35% affirmative action. But unfortunately, like I said, that bill was defeated, so it didn't go through. The most important vote probably in this election is the youth vote. They make up 70% of the voters uh, of the of the register how significant or, or how important do you think 
the candidates for the presidency are taking this particular vote? I think that when it concerns the youth votes, there is only one candidate that has actually looked at it and decided, you know what, I'm going to tailor my campaign towards the young people. And it is unfortunate because, like you said, 70% of the newly registered voters re released by INEC are young people. So you would think that a lot of the political candidates will actually try to woo them over, but that has not been the case. Young people are very passionate about this. I was just talking to one of my colleagues. He's 24 years old. And for the first time, he's very interested in the elections. And he's saying he's going out to vote. He came to ask me, did you see the Supreme Court decision? I was like, why are you talking about that? I said, because it concerns me, it affects me. And a lot of young people are saying mm. that they're going to surprise the politicians this time so, around. Uh, I'm not asking you for any predictions, but I'm just going to ask you, do you think that Nigerians are going to get the free and fair elections that they so crave for this Saturday? I cannot say, but the president, according to him, has put everything in place to make sure that happens, from security officials to also trying to control vote buying, which is one of the reasons he gave for this now redesigned policy. We would see how that plays out, really. And then, of course, we have a lot of security agencies saying that there are numbers that people can call and escalate situations to them. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, hopefully, we have a peaceful election. Faith Dafe, Joseph, thank you very much for your insight into what is a, a, turning out to be a great story to cover, I must say. And you can find lots of great material on the BBC website concerning the Nigerian elections. Just go to bbc.com forward slash Nigerian election 2023. There you find a range of background articles from our correspondents who are covering these elections. And we're here all week. We'll be here the whole of next week as well when the vote tallying begins. And we'll bring you all the latest from these Nigerian elections. Back to you in the studio in London. Peter Kocha, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, still to come on the programme, Cyclone Freddy heads back out to sea after killing at least four people on the island nation of Madagascar. It's now heading to mainland Africa with Mozambique in its sights. What makes us who we are, if not the way we experience the world? Because while first class is something you can buy, world class is everything we do. Welcome to world class. Welcome to Singapore Airlines. They say the soul never changes. While what we see around us may change and grow, the feeling of where it came will always stay the same. The soul is life, guiding us to make us who we are and where we go. And where I'm from, we go forward, while never forgetting from where we came. So come, we have much more to share. Malaysia, truly Asia. We start with a big win. Stand by for a moment of history. The headlines keep breaking. Now to football, tennis, Formula One, rugby union, FIFA, World Cup. The debate keeps raging. They're still the team to beat. My heart rate was up. Proud of everyone involved. We've only got ourselves to blame. The results keep coming. I just like cried a little bit. It's going quite well. I don't know what to say. Absolute disbelief. It means an awful lot. To be crowned champions <laughs> of the world. For all the latest results, headlines and analysis, Sport Today on BBC World News. Well, welcome back. At least four people have died after Cyclone Freddy made landfall in Madagascar. There's been heavy damage to buildings, along with power cuts and flooding in the east of the country, where amongst the casualties was a 27-year-old man. The storm is now headed towards Mozambique. Dorcas Wangira reports. When Cyclone Freddy made its landfall in Madagascar Tuesday evening, it was an intense tropical cyclone. But as it moved across Madagascar, it weakened to a tropical storm. By this evening, it is projected to leave the island. However, national authorities are urging residents to remain vigilant. 
According to government officials, four people have died, thousands have been displaced, houses have been destroyed, roofs ripped up, more buildings, including the Mananjari Stadium. The Mananjari Hospital has also been destroyed and flooding still continues and heavy rainfall in many of the affected parts. Like I said earlier, there have been four deaths, one at Maano and three in Nambalava. How and why? They died because, I'm sorry to say, it was due to negligence. Despite the awareness that we spread, people still dare to ignore the instructions and the warnings. The three that died, their house collapsed. Tropical storm Freddy is projected to make landfall in Mozambique Friday. Dorka Swangira, BBC News, Antananarivo. Okay, some other news in brief now. And the US First Lady Jill Biden is visiting Namibia at the start of a five day trip of Africa. She'll also travel to Kenya and on to other countries. Jill Biden is the fifth high profile US official to visit the continent since the US Africa summit in December 2022. Some analysts see America's renewed focus on Africa as an attempt to counter Chinese and Russian influence. The South African Finance Minister has unveiled the country's annual budget worth $254 billion. It includes debt relief for the power company ESCOM, amounting to $14 billion over the next three years. The government also announced tax incentives for businesses and individuals who install solar and other forms of renewable energy. Shemima Begum, a woman who left the UK as a 15-year-old schoolgirl to join the so-called Islamic State group in Syria in 2015, has lost an appeal against the British government's decision to remove her citizenship. Ms Begum has insisted that she was a victim of human trafficking, but her challenge was dismissed by a judge at an immigration tribunal in London. Her lawyers have vowed to fight on. Now, it's nearly a year since Vladimir Putin started his invasion of Ukraine. International criticism followed, as well as a slew of sanctions. In the last week, President Biden visited Ukraine to show his solidarity with President Zelensky. But South Africa's ruling ANC party has continuously refused to criticize Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Indeed, South Africa abstained in a vote at the United Nations Security Council meeting condemning Russia's military action. Russian naval personnel on board a frigate are currently participating in naval exercises in the Indian Ocean alongside South African and Chinese warships. The Russian vessel is carrying a hypersonic missile described as one of Moscow's most sophisticated weapons. The BBC's Nomsamazego reports from Richards Bay on the northeast coast. The captain of Russia's warship, the frigate Admiral Koshkov, which is carrying one of Moscow's most powerful weapons, has denied that a supersonic missile, which has been described as unstoppable, will be tested on South African waters. The warship, which has docked at the harbor here in Richards Bay ahead of Friday's military drill, has the letters VZ painted on the ship. The military exercise itself has been largely criticized for not being transparent. The war games between South Africa, Russia and China will coincide with the anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine this Friday. But South Africa denied that this move was provocative, claiming that this exercise was organized two years ago. While the naval exercise is expected to focus on Coast Guard and anti-piracy drills, it's also an opportunity for Russia and China to expand their push on the African continent. Nomsa Masego, BBC News. Richards Bay, South Africa. A reminder of our top story, campaigning is continuing ahead of Saturday's elections in Nigeria. Today, top political leaders signed a peace accord promising to hold free and fair elections and to maintain peace during the election period. Ahead of the polls, there have been outbreaks of political violence in several parts of the country, with some candidates being forced to abandon their campaigns. Well, don't forget that you can get in touch with me on social media. On Twitter, I'm at Lequessa Bureau. You can also get in touch with BBC World uh, from where we broadcast a force at BBC World. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
Introducing the new horizon for Riyadh. This is the new Maraba, the world's largest modern downtown, and at its heart, the Mukab, the world's first immersive experiential.